I'm Rob Hamilton. I'm the Regional Vice President of Sales for Z Omega, and I'm uh, thrilled in our company being a new vendor member partner to Flacco um, and for this nice opportunity here today. Um, this webinar today, titled The Five Pillars of Population Health, will be the first of what we hope will be a series of others in the months ahead. Uh, and today will uh, be presented by uh, our Dr. Christopher Matthews. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce you all uh, to Dr. Matthews. Thanks very much, Jim and Laura. This is Christopher Matthews. I hope folks can hear me. Um, today we're going to talk about the five pillars of population health. And first, uh, before I do that, I wanted to just uh, tell you very quickly uh, about my credentials in the organization so you can get a sense of where we're coming from. So I am trained as an internal medicine physician, worked for many years in clinical practice, and uh, 10 years at an organization called Pacific Medical Center out of Seattle, which is actually my, where I live. And there we, took, we had uh, multi-specialty uh, clinical services, uh, and we took on uh, full-risk contracts with numerous payers. Uh, and we even ran our own claim shop, so a lot of exposure with taking on financial risk from a delivery system side. And then I worked for many years for a managed care health plan uh, uh, overseeing case disease utilization management, pharmacy, et cetera. So that's my background. I've been with Z Omega as their chief medical officer for a little over four years. And I'll tell you now a bit here about uh, our organization. So we are a software company. We're a population health management software company. Got our start in the early 2000s, making a product that supported chronic care management workflow for Medicaid fee-for-service programs. And in the first 10 years, our product uh, advanced really to become a fully integrated, automated, configurable, rules-driven uh, flow management tool for care coordination, case and disease management, and utilization review. So our clients really on, as you can see some of their, their labels here, were primarily payers. Also, during that time, we developed increasingly sophisticated data aggregation and analytic capabilities, really helping to answer the, answer the question, which patient or which patients are my next most important ones to focus on and what are suggested interventions. Last year, we acquired another firm called Health Unity. Assets from that acquisition enabled us to provide additional product capabilities of particular interest for providers who are taking on financial risk in value-based care models such as ACOs. Those capabilities included things such as uh, health information exchange capability, uh, master provider and master patient index capabilities, and referral management. Over the last four years, we've grown considerably. We have comprehensive product capabilities supporting performance-driven population health in any or all entities who are participating in value-based care programs. Our product is called Jiva, J-I-V-A, Jiva. Between our delivery system clients and our payer clients, and again, you can see some of their logos on this slide, uh, we now support population health initiatives serving approximately 30 million Americans. In the past years, we've developed this overall vision and strategy that centers on what we call the five pillars of population health. And this presentation will help you understand what those pillars are and why they're so foundational for a successful population health uh, program. So I wanted to speak first about uh, what I call healthcare's perfect storm, because there are a number of uh, 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 changes that are occurring in the U.S. healthcare marketplace, um, which are leading to inevitable change, uh, and it is just not the case that we're going to be retreating back to traditional fee-for-service or fee-for-volume uh, service delivery uh, in the future. We're going to gradually move more and more toward risk-based uh, reimbursement methodology tied to quality and cost. The World Health Organization notes that 18% of our GDP is spent on health care and that per personal out-of-pocket expenses uh, by health care consumers have risen to 21% of the total health care dollar. So this rise in out-of-pocket expenses represents cost shifting, of course, to consumers and has occurred over a very short period of time. 
compelling our patients to become much more involved in determining which services they will consume where and when. The ACA, or Affordable Care Act, has added, of course, millions of people to insurance roles. Fully 87% of those who gained coverage through exchanges were uninsured at the time of their enrollment, many with deferred care needs. This has created increased demand for services, particularly primary care at a time when supply is short. It has also caused a number of payers participating in the health exchanges to post record losses financially. There's a rapid rise in the Medicare population, largely due to aging baby, baby boomers, with estimates of 76 million Americans covered under Medicare by 2030. Nearly half of the US adult population has two or more chronic conditions. And with this profile, the need for supportive condition management and care coordination is, of course, rising. There are also regulatory changes um, uh, at play, which are helping to create aligned incentives for providers to begin to work with payers and others in new ways uh, to support value-based care initiatives. Research by uh, the RWJ Foundation shows that physicians do commonly identify care coordination as a critical add-on to, to um, their traditional condition management. And they recognize that care coordination really helps address some of the psychosocial and other care needs of the patient. But most physicians in clinical practice are asking for help in how to do this. The ability to effectively perform complex chronic condition management is also critical, not just for quality of care and meeting quality for performance targets, but also for controlling costs. Chronic condition management typically requires engagement of clinical team members other than physicians, as much of the care plan is carried out between office visits and requires skills and interventions that are performed by non-physicians. In 2015, and many of you I'm sure are aware of this, 2015 CMS started reimbursing uh, for complex case management and care coordination services, recognizing the critical need for financial reimbursement in these areas if value-based care efforts were to be embraced by physicians. Such reimbursement provides or begins to provide the financial wherewithal to help practice ex practices um, expand their care teams and provide the types of services required for effective PHM. In today's discussion, I'll talk a bit about this new care team, what it might look like, and expanded services they might provide. There are also social political forces in play, with perhaps the most profound impact being the creation of the health exchanges, uh, uh, where millions of Americans now go to shop for personal health insurance coverage. A predicted but underappreciated impact from the creation of these exchanges has been the reduction of employer-sponsored coverage. And in fact, last year, WellPoint reported that small businesses are moving employees off employer-sponsored health plans into the healthcare marketplace at a rate two years faster than they had expected. So a lot of employers are seeing this as an opportunity uh, to uh, shift the costs and the responsibility uh, uh, across to their employees. There are also new uh, market opportunities being created by societal changes. Patients increasingly want immediate, convenient access to care for acute care services and for health and wellness interventions. Having to call for an appointment in a doctor's office possibly waiting several days to be seen, having to be seen between eight and five, having long waits once you arrive. All of these are increasingly viewed as inconvenient, inefficient, and of poor service quality. So there's a shift we're seeing to conveniently located clinics with extended hours that can provide basic minor acute care and health and wellness interventions. And we think that this will continue to increase rapidly. An example of a response to that demand for walk-in convenience clinics, the national pharmacy chain CVS has quickly rebranded itself, I'm sure many of you know this, uh, as a healthcare company, banning tobacco products in its retail outlets and proposing new copays through its PBM arm that provide incentives to consumers to fill prescriptions only at tobacco-free pharmacies. They're opening thousands of walk-in clinics around the country and most recently announced an affiliation with several major health systems to integrate those systems, EHRs, into the CVS network of minute clinics. So we're beginning to see a fundamental shift in where and how clinical care is provided. 
cloud computing and personal use of mobile technology are now deeply embedded in how uh, we go about our daily lives and how we do business and access to information uh, 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 just in time information by consumers of healthcare is becoming uh, mandatory. So patients are increasingly interested in accessing such information. They want to know about cost and quality of the services that they're about to purchase. So how is this sort of perfect storm impacting healthcare organizations? Prescribing providers uh, participating in shared risk relationships such as ACOs have to fundamentally change their approach and their care team's approach to serving their patients. While just-in-time acute care driven primarily by patient self-activation will remain critical, these providers will now have to learn how to expertly and proactively care for full populations for whom they care a responsibility to optimize care and from which they carry financial risk. Many of those patients, some estimates are more than half of those patients, may not be active uh, uh, in your delivery system and yet you may be taking financial risk for them. So care teams have to uh, evolve. We, need, we see a need to grow and leverage members of a care team trying to ensure that they perform at the top of their licensure and perform a variety of functions that we know are necessary for effective PHM. They must have access to robust data and actionable intelligence to understand where within the population they manage they carry the most risk. They need to know which interventions and by whom are most likely to be of highest value. They have to learn how to better coordinate care across an entire care continuum. And they need to ensure that relevant clinical data are transmitted accurately and timely in a secure fashion. Savvy prescribing providers will recognize and respond to cost containment incentives by beginning to move services away from expensive facilities toward office space and home care services. So health plans and providers are forming new business relationships designed to manage the health of defined populations. As an example, Aetna, United, Cigna, have all formed ACOs with University affiliated hospitals in the Cleveland, Ohio area. Those ACOs now cover over 200,000 patients in pediatric, commercial, employee, and Medicare ACOs, and attributed over a billion dollars in revenue in those relationships. Rapid technological innovation, of course, is allowing full data aggregation and the emerging of analytics with workflows uh, to provide solutions that were not previously available, and I'll go into that in some detail with the five pillars. So there's a realization here that much of the work of effectively controlling costs while improving quality rests on timely and accurate identification of subpopulations of patients for whom you carry risk, but who may not be presenting themselves timely or at all to the PCP's office. For large numbers of these patients, the type of outreach, assessments, and care planning that are necessary for effective engagement are completely different than what typically occurs between a prescribing provider and a patient during a routine office visit. So first, what, what is actually population health or population health management? And my guess is if you ask 100 people, you get 100 different definitions. We've thought a lot about this, and we actually defaults to uh, Don Berwick's triple aim. This concept now is not new. Um, the goals, really, of effective PHM are straightforward, but they're often very, very difficult to achieve. So thinking of the triple aim, it includes improving the overall health of the population being served within the ACO, while improving their experience of care, and slowly, slowing or possibly even dropping the overall projected cost of care. This again describes what we now call the triple aim, which Don Berwick first posited when he was leading the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Triple, the uh, triple aim is now typically what value-based programs attempt to achieve, and at a high level help us define population health management. Providers are increasingly involved, of course, in PHM programs, often with shared risk or shared, shared savings program components. A recent survey by Health Leaders Media Council, which included 349 respondents from hospitals, health systems, and physician practices, 
about readiness for PHM found that most healthcare delivery organizations are moving to PHM models and that they start predominantly with shared savings contracts with payers. In the survey, about 80% of the responders had some type of PHM program underway, 49% saying they were fully committed, and about 31% with the pilot program. Factoring into every PHM model is care coordination and case management, population management analytics to help identify and stratify the population, and making the results of those analyses actionable by tying to critical workflows for various members of the expanded care team. Additionally, financial performance data are critical and ideally combined with service and clinical quality data to provide an overall picture of the value of healthcare services provided. So the goal, of course, is to improve, if at all possible, the health and well-being of each individual served. This requires that we have the ability to support our patients through their entire lifespans, from birth to end of life. We also have to know where the patient is in real time across the care continuum during an episode of care. We must be capable of reassessing their needs each step of the way, and we must ensure a seamless handoff of the patient and essentials of the medical record and care plan during each care transition. Importantly, we can't be successful by focusing exclusively on the patient's medical diagnoses. Those are critical, but we have to also address the full spectrum of psychosocial determinants of health, and I'll speak more to this in a few minutes. Of course, all of this activity has to be done in a consistent fashion for each and every patient in the population that we serve. So while we take care of the individual needs of each patient who is active in our system, we must also assess the care needs of the entire population that we're serving, and this, of course, is a very tall order. That previously cited uh, health leaders survey noted that hospitals are recognizing that in the world of PHM, they're just another care delivery site, and the most health care is actually done outside the hospital, even outside the doctor's office. Hospitals are and will continue to be critical in the delivery of care to our sickest patients. However, hospitals are often expensive places to receive care, and for providers at risk for cost containment, the pressures to move services to less expensive settings is huge. So for ACOs, this means that participating hospitals are faced with a particular quandary, that the best strategy to control costs may be one that leaves some of their beds unfilled and may have a negative impact on their bottom line. So working strategically with hospital partners thus becomes a critical objective early in the formation of ACOs. So given the inherent complexity in this challenge, what is needed for a successful PHA program? Expansion of the care team turns out to be critical, as physicians and other primary or specialty care providers cannot do the work alone. There are both bandwidth and skill set issues in play here. A fully developed care team will include a prescribing provider, a care coordinator, a nurse case manager, a social worker, and ready access to behavioral health specialists and pharmacists. Each member of a care team really does need to practice to the limits of their licensure and needs access to specific, highly focused data based upon their unique role. This means that we have to have the ability to capture and aggregate data from numerous sources, the ability to standardize these data, and to query the data in real time or near real time via a robust analytics process. Such a process is required to produce what we call actionable intelligence that's unique, uniquely supplied to each member of the care team. To optimize work efficiency and to be able to report on the work being done, standardized workflows for care team members are essential. This ensures that each member of the care team is performing to his or her duties optimally and assists them in working to the limits of their licensure. Workflows embedded within PHM software should ideally be configurable, allowing end users to design their workflows based upon their unique requirements or priorities. There are numerous other individuals, of course, who support the care team, such as analysts, financial and compliance personnel, and administrators who must also have access to relevant information for their scopes of work. 
An ideal system creates a virtual, self-enhancing work environment from analytics to actionable intelligence to real-time configurability and workflow support with an underlying rule, rules engine, which can help automate the entire process. So with this as a background, we get to the five pillars of population health management. And for the rest of my talk, I'll go in to some detail about what each of these pillars uh, contains. So pillar one, let me open this slide all the way here. We call program design and governance. It's very essential for organizations participating in PHM models where there are shared risk relationships to ensure that the proper governance structure, accountability, and decision-making authority are well-defined. Having clarity of purpose is essential. Just exactly why are we participating in a PHM program? Typically, the answer reflects a vision and a commitment of improving the overall health of a defined population, improving the experience of care, and controlling costs. In other words, the triple aim. With this in mind, a clear set of goals organized around quality, patient experience, and costs is essential. Typically, compliance requirements also come into play in order to satisfy the needs of the payer participant. Having measurable objectives tied to those goals is essential. There may be both short-term goals or objectives, like what measures will your shared savings model initially be based on, and then long-term ones. For example, we may have a goal of improving the health status of our population of diabetics. A common short-term objective is improving compliance with regular eye and foot exams or ensuring timely hemoglobin A1C testing. But a longer-term objective might actually be improving this population's survey rating of, this, of their own perception of their overall health status has it improved over time. Collecting baseline performance data that tie to your measurable, measurable objectives is, of course, critical and raises the issue of data source, integrity, et cetera, and I'll speak to that uh, in another one of our pillars. Completing a gap analysis between current performance and the stated objectives is necessary. This in mind, what do you see as your strengths? What are some important gaps in capability, and how will you close those gaps? Ultimately, an overall execution plan is required one that builds on your organizational strengths, one that recognizes and effectively deals with identified program risks. This plan must ensure that all key stakeholders have aligned incentives and buy-in, such as ensuring that your hospital providers have appropriate safeguards to mitigate the risk of their bottom line if bed days go down. In many ways, this is the most difficult step for organizations that may not have a history of working collaboratively together. With implementation of the plan, we have to ensure that we have the ability to collect necessary data and that reporting capabilities are in place to track performance over time. Clinical and service quality performance measurements, along with utilization and cost performance measurement, require hierarchical dashboards that summarize these data in meaningful or actionable ways for the end user, whether that be an ACO executive who's scanning at a fairly high level overall performance based uh, tied to contract, a leader of a group of providers or care teams or the individual physician. More on the challenge of this data collection and aggregation in a few minutes. Forming the uh, organizational governance and structure, setting a vision, goals, measurable objectives, devising a plan of action, collecting baseline performance data, all of this requires tremendous organizational leadership. It requires development of trust relationships between key players of all participating entities, often a challenge given where we sometimes see it's historically strained relationships between payers and providers and between hospitals and prescribing providers. And importantly, it requires tremendous change management knowledge and skill. Doing all of this, especially completing a baseline assessment, tracking and measuring performance over time, requires, of course, sophisticated technology tools. And this then gets us to our uh, second pillar. Let's see if I can open this screen all the way. 
So the second pillar is data integration and aggregation. And I see this perhaps as the most challenging or uh, historically vexing uh, problem in population health. Maybe optimistically, I think of this interoperability required to climb toward the, toward the uh, top of this pillar as the, the new wine and the old bottle. And I say optimistically because I see the industry getting closer all the time, and yet significant challenges remain. Capturing data in real time or near real time from disparate sources, normalizing the data so that they can be properly integrated, and then running sophisticated analytics on these data so that all members of the care team have access to actionable intelligence is, of course, a huge challenge. Historically, many organizations have relied primarily upon demographic data, age, sex, marital status, et cetera, along with billing and or claims data uh, from the medical record, uh, billing data or claims data or elements of the medical record to begin to paint a picture of the population they serve. Most organizations have not had access to all of those sources of data, and yet each uh, data set turns out to be critical for success. Bringing in structured data from the lab, diagnostic imaging, pharmacy, and from the patients themselves provides a much more robust picture of our population if members of the population are actually accessing the healthcare system. Integrating paid claims data with that from the EHR turns out to be especially important, and even more so being able to integrate data from many EHRs and potential, potentially several claim shops becomes important and challenging. So-called big data sources, something that we're now using in our product, such as census tract data, can also be used to infer certain population characteristics, such as economic status, community safety, access to public transportation, et cetera. These data are particularly helpful when dealing with that sector of your population that's never made a clinic visit and yet re may require your proactive outreach and intervention. So-called structured data from all these sources are the easiest to identify and use. But the real challenge going forward is making use of unstructured data, such as we find in physician and nurses' notes. This is often where additional insight or nuance about a particular patient may be found. This requires sophisticated natural language processing capabilities to fully decipher. Point to point, point, to point batching of data and sending it in a file format monthly, weekly, or daily is still commonly in use. And increasingly, we're seeing, and our clients certainly are demanding real-time self-authenticating data processing. Moving from the bottom left on this graph toward the upper right is, of course, everyone's goal. and paints a picture of the next generation of data optimization. In accessing these data, interpreting the data, and integrating such data with everything else remains a huge challenge. The name of the game is interoperability, how to get disparate systems to effectively talk to each other. And I still see this as a huge challenge in the healthcare industry. Health Integration Exchanges, or HIEs, can provide a secure method of sharing patient information between different entities who share accountability for the care of a patient or a population. This, in fact, becomes an essential must-have technology capability for an advanced PHM program. Key functionalities required to effectively integrate data from these entities include things like having a master patient and master provider index along with the ability to process data to eliminate duplicates. The effective system automates that process, sorting through with very high reliability errors in the spelling of names, addresses, birth dates, etc. Many of us are aware of the painful process of trying to sort out which of the John Smiths is the same person or which of the numerous electronically transferred copies of the medical record are redundant and could or should be deleted. The good news is that the technology now exists through MPI and duplicate elimination functionality to manage these issues very efficiently and with exceedingly high reliability. Authenticating the data, normalizing the data, and providing a hierarchy of data based upon source reliability are also required features of effective data integration. 
if a patient self-reports that their latest hemoglobin A1C was 7.2, the last data feed from the lab shows it as 8.2, which result do you rely upon? Or if a preliminary lab result shows a positive urine culture and a later lab result shows E. coli sensitive to amoxicillin, which one would you like to have displayed in your PHM record? Or perhaps you'd like to have both values displayed for the clinical decision maker. Finally, natural language processing, the ability to accurately extract data from unstructured data, this is really the latest frontier in this arena, is something that we're still working on to bring into our product. Merging all relevant data from disparate sources into a single data repository, doing this in real time or in neutral time, remains, of course, a challenge. Yet it is ultimately essential for successful advanced PHM programs. So this then is our second pillar, data aggregation and integration. So let's move now to the third pillar, which we call actionable intelligence. Once you have all the data, what do you actually do with it? The goal is to convert the aggregated data into what I call actionable intelligence. There's a hierarchy of data that comes in various forms, has variable reliability and usefulness. And over time, we've been able to steadily add more complicated and nuanced data to our data repositories, and in the process, move toward data that one might view as more actionable. We see a logical progression in the use of data to support effective PHM programs. This starts with basic reporting capabilities, standard reports that provide data on operational metrics, standard process and outcomes reporting, standard reports that effectively address basic compliance reporting requirements. Business intelligence tools can allow power users to build their own dashboards and drill down into data to answer specific questions in real time or near real time with the creation of ad hoc reports. For example, what percentage of my population of diabetics has had an eye exam in the last 11 months? And how has this percentage changed over time? Why 11 months? Because as many of you know, if you're being measured on your ability to close the care gap within a year or 12 months, you actually need to know which patients still have the gap as the year draws to a close yet still have enough time to do effective outreach to close the gap. Through the use of business intelligence tools in data mining, we have the ability to apply analytic capabilities to the data produced by members of the care team, and most importantly, embed the results of such analyses into their workflows. So within minutes, you can identify that population of your diabetics who are at risk of falling out of compliance, uh, uh, with their required testing within the next 30 days, and then launch a campaign and outreach effort to close those gaps. So the ability to risk stratify a population, create patient registries, and support the critical work of improving quality scorecard performance. Ultimately, we want a sophisticated predictive analytics machine that leads to real-time data-driven adjustment of risk, and that includes nuances such as an individual patient's ability to understand and engage in a treatment plan or their readiness to change personal behavior. Additionally, the analytics need to interface with the unique workflows of each care team member so that each of us better understands what is the next best thing to do for my patient. A well-developed PHM solution provides all of the analytic capabilities needed for each of these care team members and links the results to their workflows. So back to the data. Some data, such as billing or claims data, can be used for baseline risk stratification or of whole populations and understanding preliminarily which patients may benefit from specific programs. For example, of your population of diabetics, who at first glance may benefit from a complex case management intervention versus who might simply require a periodic educational mailing or a text reminder that it's time for an annual eye exam. Claims and demographic data alone may provide you a rough perspective of the population so that you can sort them into high, medium, and low-risk subpopulations. However, the limited and historical data derived from claims, though quite valuable, is by itself insufficient for the more nuanced approach needed for highly effective PHM programs. 
data from the EHR are also insufficient as many of your more complex patients have critical information residing in multiple EHRs. Numerous at-risk patients have no data at all within the EHR because they haven't made a clinic visit. And EHRs don't contain typically all kinds of important data, such as comprehensive assessments of the psychosocial factors influence a person's, influencing a person's health and wellness, their level of health literacy, or their readiness to change. So having both claims data and billing and EHR data turned out to be very important. Other data, such as patient self-reported data, are critical to understand specific patient wants and needs, and in particular to understand what non-clinical factors are driving a patient's behavior and whether or not the patient is able and willing to engage. This refined data set, when fully analyzed, allows for much more sophisticated stratification of the patient population, and it's something that advanced PHM technology solutions provide. Effective PHM solutions not only bring these data forward, but they assign specific segments of the population into work lists that feed into the workflows designed in the product again, to uniquely support each and every member of your care team. All of these care team members will be doing critical work that is fundamentally different than the physician or other prescribing provider performs in a clinical office visit. This work is typically supported in a robust PHM solution and not well supported or supported at all with traditional EHR solutions. For example, of the highest risk patients, which ones are most actionable? These patients, which ones need a care coordinator as they move from one institution to another? Which ones are most at risk for readmission to the acute care facility and why? What interventions can be suggested to reduce the risk of readmission? Which ones need and will respond to complex case management? Which ones are best served by entering into a medication therapy management program? And should this be done by your nurse or pharmacist? which patients are most in need of a behavioral health or social services intervention? And finally, which patients do you not want to intervene with right now? Because your analytics shows you that they're healthy, or because they have strong evidence that they are not ready or willing to change or to engage in a personal plan of care. It is this very careful and sophisticated data analysis interfacing with the workflow tools used by each member of your care team that adds huge value to a PHM program. As we move up this hierarchy of data, we're better able to achieve true actionable intelligence and are ultimately able to get to where real-time big data analytics truly drives personalized population health. So with that, let's get back to our care team. And this is our fourth pillar. The real point, of course, of population health management is how to provide best care to each and every patient in your population while also serving the needs of the entire population. For the care team members, evidence-based decision-making tools and references are key to moving effectively toward value-based care. These tools can act as guidelines or be used to validate actions taken by various members of the care team while they focus on personalizing the care as appropriate to the unique needs of each individual patient. Good PHM software solutions are rich in clinical content and provide ready access for its users to links and references to the research that supports the recommendations embedded within the product. Patients and their caregivers need us to effectively engage with them, regardless of where they receive their care. So while many patients are ambulatory and may come to your office, a significant percentage of your high-risk, high-cost patients may be homebound or in a long-term care setting. And of course, our expanded care team may be providing services or care in a variety of these settings. So we need to ensure that each team member can access critical information and perform her or his job in a highly supported way, regardless of where they care for their patients. And this means that ideally our data will sit in the cloud, as ours does, and team members can access the patient information they need and perform their work with the use of secure, portable devices. Very importantly, our actionable intelligence needs to account for all of the domains of health. We use something called the seven domains of health, physical, intellectual, 
emotional, social, environmental, financial, and spiritual. Only through this 360 degree assessment of a patient can you really begin to understand not only their own perception of their health status, but what barriers might exist preventing them from understanding a care plan or effectively complying with the care plan. According to a 2014 Robert Wood Johnson study, about 40% of one's overall health status is actually determined by social and behavioral factors, things such as literacy or health literacy, the presence of a reliable caregiver, safe home environment, reliable access to transportation, et cetera, et cetera. So outreach to your patients and capturing these non-clinical data are essential for an effective PHM program, and a PHM software solution needs to be designed to fully support the team members as they complete such assessments on their patients. Providing a holistic view of one's patients by incorporating these seven domains of health in one's assessment provides the additional, more nuanced information needed to really understand which patients are actionable and what is the single next best thing to do for them. So now if we go back to this, uh, to a picture of our care team, we can see that various members of the care team or those who support them uh, must have access to the integrated data uh, that produce ultimately sophisticated analytics and provide for each of the team members' workflows in an actionable way. So this then brings us uh, to pillar number five. I'll skip ahead here now to the next slide. Stakeholder engagement. We used to think of this as more sort of consumer engagement, but realize that it's quite frankly not just about engaging the patient or consumer of care, but also figuring out how to engage physicians and other prescribing providers in a remarkably new way of providing care. We have to educate our uh, consumers uh, or patients that provide useful information to all members of the care team at the same time. For consumers of care, we're entering a new world where their engagement in the decision-making process is increasingly an informed and active one. For these patients, having access to updated local data on which healthcare providers are best at performing certain services or having access to consumer satisfaction data or cost data becomes important. To providers, we must bring forward exactly the right information at the right time in the best possible location. Just providing information, whether it be to consumers or members of the care team, is not enough, of course. We also have to be able to effectively engage them. For our patients, we need to think of new ways to engage them in a dialogue that helps assess their health status, the need for change, if any, their readiness to change, factors that may promote healthy choices, and finally identify the risk of change fatigue. A high percentage of patients now access information and engage effectively through their handheld devices. So presenting information, tools for engagement, providing when appropriate incentives for engagement in an easy, attractive, and compelling smartphone format has become increasingly important. Good PHM solutions provide not only the actionable intelligence and workflows for the care team members, but also provide similar streamlined versions for our patients. We also include such features as secure messaging so that the patient can have an active, secure dialogue via their handheld device with a specific member of the care team. Providers are already as busy as they can be, of course, leaving their EMR or EHR to go out to another software program or hunt through a separate database is just not going to work. Yet there's no EMR today that provides the analytic capabilities and the configurable workflows that are really required for a successful PHM program. So a solution must provide for appropriate integration between the EHR and a PHM software solution, one that works well for the, for the um, prescribing provider, but also works well for each and every other member of the care team and also has uh, functional access for our patients and their caregivers at home. Finally, we have to empower both the consumer of healthcare and all members of the care team. This is, at the end of the day, a collaboration between a patient, their caregiver, and members of the care team. 
Each of these individuals need access to appropriate decision support tools, prescribing providers and consumers need cost and price transparency. All parties need and want real-time information that speaks to quality of care and is relevant for their own needs. And of course, everyone, for everyone, we really have to deliver this information in the most efficient and convenient manner possible. Unless people are really engaged, informed, and empowered, will not be able to maximize the benefits that PHM can provide. So doing this well helps us achieve the key stakeholder commitment and empowerment that the last pillar of the PHM is all about. So there it is, the five pillars of population health management, program design and governance, data integration and aggregation, actionable intelligence, holistic patient-centered care, and stakeholder engagement. Listed on this slide are some key features or attributes that support each of these pillars. I mentioned a number of these uh, in this presentation. Uh, but to, together, these pillars really form a solid foundation for a highly successful population health management program. I want to take just a couple minutes and uh, go through quickly two more slides. This is a picture, uh, sort of a summary view of a comprehensive PHM software platform. Such a platform's architecture is designed to enable modular deployment of a full suite of capabilities based on a single source of truth. This design allows for newly formed ACOs to implement limited portions of the software to meet their immediate needs, but then to add capabilities easily as they take on more risk. Such a system is capable, you see across the top, capable of importing, normalizing, and aggregating data in real-time or near-real-time from virtually all sources, such as from the lab or imaging providers, various EHRs, you can use across your delivery system, self-reported data, etc. At its core, as you see in the central portion of the circle, the system provides an enterprise-level data warehouse, storing the above data, and making it accessible for critical functionality, such as risk assessing the population, populating assessments, feeding work queues for various members of your care team, supporting campaign management and correspondence, and so on. Around that core, the system provides rules engines and a baseline of functionality that allows for real-time configuration so that users of the system can make changes to meet their unique organizational needs and not have to rely upon the vendor. Such capability creates remarkable product flexibility and efficiency. Surrounding those rules engines are workflow capabilities. These are essential include things such as real-time data transfer via a functional HIE, support of care transitions, complex case management and care coordination, support for quality initiatives and campaigns, compliance reporting, et cetera. The merging of the results of complex analytic capabilities with these workflows, initiatives, and reporting are uniquely important for PHM. It cannot be achieved by mainstream EHRs in the market today. All this must be permeated with referenceable evidence-based guidelines that support disparate interventions such as closing gaps in care, medication management, completion of integrated assessments for complex case management, and support for special populations such as high-risk pregnancies and behavioral health patients. From the prior slide, you can see the level of sophistication and complexity that can accompany a fully developed PHM solution. That fortunately, at least in our case, we have the ability to deliver key components of functionality that meet the needs of the ACO whether it's just getting started with the pay for performance initiative or has moved all the way up this curve uh, to one or more full risk relationships. So I know we're getting sh a little bit short of time here. So with that, I want to thank you and um, open it up uh, and see if you have any questions. There's any more than happy to address questions you have. And I have on this slide my uh, uh, office phone number. Let's see if I can back up the slide. There's my direct email and my mobile phone, so I would also encourage you to reach out to me directly for more discussion if you're interested. We hand this back to Laura. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matthews. If you have any questions, you can go on ahead and uh, submit them through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. 
and we will relay those and uh, let uh, Dr. Matthews and Rob answer those as they come in. Doesn't look like I have any that have been submitted so far, but we can give it just a few minutes here. I am aware that we, uh, I threw a lot of information at you very, very fast. I could go into great detail on any one of these pillars. So if you'd like more information, you want a more in-depth discussion, or just have questions and you want to take those offline and chat with me privately, please feel free to reach out to me. I don't see any questions that are coming through, so um, I think we can go on ahead and wrap up for today. We will um, certainly be sharing uh, Dr. Matthews and Rob's uh, contact information with everyone. Um, you'll also receive an email that has um, the link to view the recording again. If you feel free certainly to share this with anyone that you think might be interested. Um, we will also be sending out email announcements for upcoming webinars um, as well as information soon regarding the fall conference that will be October 13th and 14th in Orlando. Um, so thank you everyone so much for your time today and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody.